Dr. Carrier is a uh, has a PhD in the history of religion from Columbia, and he's a published author and uh, philosopher. He's going to talk to us a little bit today about uh, Christianity without Jesus, and uh, he teaches classes online. His books and his classes are available at Richard Carrier that info. Please welcome Dr. Carrier to the stage. Thank you, sir. Voila. Okay. Um, I'm going to do something a little different today than I've done in a lot of talks before. I'm not going to make the case uh, that Jesus didn't exist. If you want that, that case, like, there are other talks that you can go find um, online. Uh, and my book on the historicity of Jesus lays out the case. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to say, well, let's just take that as a given. There was no Jesus, not even an ordinary dude walking around starting a thing. If that's the case, how did Christianity begin? Why did it begin? What, what was the actual motivation? for starting the religion and so on. So this is, we're going to explore this and the, what you'll learn is a lot of interesting um, stuff about ancient religion as well and how Christianity made sense in its context. Now I'm going to start by telling you something a lot of people don't know about, which is the original Jesus was a space alien, um, in a sense. Uh, we know from Philo of Alexandria, who's writing in the 20s, 30s AD, uh, that he, um, this is a, one of the greatest Jewish theologians uh, of the time, and he wrote about a particular angel in Jewish angelology, and he says that this particular angel uh, is the same character named Jesus in this particular Old Testament passage in Zechariah that he points out. So that here we have a passage in the Old Testament with a, a god named, or a, an angel named Jesus, and Philo is saying that that's this particular angel, and this is what he says. Uh, he says this angel is the firstborn son of God. Does that sound familiar? He says he's the celestial image of God. He's God's agent of creation. In other words, God couldn't be bothered to actually do the creation. He actually sent this angel to go do it for him. And he's God's celestial high priest because, you know, everything on earth is all dirty and messy and you got to have your own super uh, amazing space alien temple. Um, so you have the temple on earth is just a dim copy of the true space temple. Uh, and you have to have a true space priest for the space temple. And the interesting thing with this, though, is that this is exactly the Jesus that's in the epistles. All the exact same attributes, same guy. So in fact, the Christians were worshiping a pre, an angel in Jewish angelology that already existed uh, before there would have been any historical man needed to explain the origins of the, of the religion. So it looks like that's what they're doing. It looks like Jesus of the epistles is just like Gabriel, Michael, and the other angels. It's just a particular one, the supreme angel, uh, that did all of this stuff and had all of these attributes. So we know that. And in Philippians, it tells us that the earliest known Christians, and this is what the Christians did that was different. Um, Philo is talking about this particular angel, but the Christians added a twist, and what they said is, the earliest known Christians believe that this pre-existent being descended, became incarnate, and died, and rose again, then appeared to select people to tell them all this. That's, the, that's what we see in Philippians and in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, what if this incarnation, death, and burial took place in outer space just below the moon. And you might be thinking, why on earth would we think that? Uh, there's some reason. Uh, one is that the same was taught of Osiris. Uh, Osiris was the savior god of Egypt, the neighboring province to Judea, and Osiris had his own evangelists missionizing uh, his religion all throughout the Roman Empire. Public stories about Osiris put him on earth in earth history. <coughs> But private stories, the stories told to initiates of the cult, put his death and resurrection in outer space just below the moon. The earthly stories were just intended to be allegories or to conceal the true cosmic uh, message of the religion. So this was already going on. So if you're going to create your own dying and rising savior, and you've got this neighboring uh, dying and rising savior over there, you can see how it would be easy to adopt the same model and just convert it to a Jewish idea. 
There are also precedents in Jewish belief. Um, Adam was believed to have been buried in outer space, according to the revelation of Moses, either on Venus or Mars, depending on which uh, scheme they were using at the time. So um, if you really want fundamentalist Christians to increase the budget of NASA, uh, you can maybe convince them that we might find the bones of Adam on one of those planets. So is this the same Jesus? Are we just talking about the same Jesus? Is the Jesus that so-called originated Christianity, is he just like this? We have some clues that it was. We have a gospel called the Ascension of Isaiah. Um, it's gone through a lot of redactions. Christians kept changing it and adding stuff. Uh, the earliest redaction that we can reconstruct from the surviving materials uh, was written sometime in the late first, early second century, sometime between the 80s and 130 AD. And in fact, this is the exact same time that the canonical gospels were being written. So at the same time that the gospels that are putting Jesus on earth were being written, there's another sect of Christian who were generating their own gospels at the same time. The Ascension of Messiah is one of them. The interesting thing about it is this, ascent, this gospel doesn't have Jesus walking around Galilee. It doesn't have a ministry. Instead, it's the prophet Isaiah has a vision in which God explains uh, how Jesus affects salvation. And in the earliest redaction that we can reconstruct of this, Jesus doesn't go to Earth. He descends to the uh, outer space just below the moon, where he is crucified by Satan and his sky demons. Um, and there he's buried and resurrected, and then appears uh, to select followers to send them out as missionaries. Now, <clears throat> that's interesting. Um, so if, if that's the case, then we know there was a sect of Christians who actually were believing this. So then the question becomes, which sect of Christians, they're, at this, they're coexisting at the same time, which one is closer to the original teaching of the religion? We have another clue in 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter is a forgery. That's a uh, mainstream uh, view. Everybody agrees who's not a fundamentalist. Um, whoever, wrote, whoever wrote the canonical text of 2 Peter was a different author than the author who wrote 1 Peter. Uh, so we definitely know 2 Peter is a forgery because it refers to 1 Peter. So what happens in this? Uh, one thing that happens in this letter is uh, that we have a statement. He's arguing, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then it immediately forges an eyewitness account of meeting Jesus on earth. Now, what does it do this for? It says, it's doing this to answer otherwise unknown Christians, a fellow Christian sect, who were claiming that such a Jesus was a, quote unquote, cleverly devised myth. Now, of course, they, that sect, this is the derogatory way of saying it, but that sect would have said sacred allegories, that the so-called cleverly devised myths are just sacred allegories for the cosmic truth. That's how they would phrase it. But this letter was written to attack those and dis denounce them as false Christians. But what this tells us is that there was a sect of Christians that actually believed that the Gospels were sacred myths, that they were allegories for cosmic truths, that there was no meeting with Jesus on earth. And uh, we hear nothing else about that sect. We have none of their writings, unless the Ascension of Isaiah, for example, is one of them. Um, we hear nothing else about them. We don't get to listen to them. We don't get to hear their texts of it. And this is uh, just one sort of throwaway reference to them. So their existence from history has been almost erased. But that gives us a clue that there were these Christians. Uh, now, what would that mean? Here's an analogy. In Islam, Muhammad has conversations with the angel Gabriel, and the Quran records the spoken teachings of Gabriel. I don't know if you know this, but this means the founder of Islam is Gabriel. Uh, Muhammad is just the Paul. He's just the apostle conveying the teachings. So in fact, the actual founder of Islam is a non-existent person. Uh, similar to Mormonism, Joseph Smith claims to have conversations with the angel Moroni and seeing words on magical plates, and the Book of Mormon records what the latter two said. Once again, the angel Moroni is the actual founder of Mormonism. Joseph Smith is just acting in the role of Peter, Paul, and the apostles. So this is what I'm proposing, uh, and I uh, argue in On the History of the City of Jesus, is how Christianity began, that Jesus originally started like these angels uh, and then was later transported into history. Now, there are precedents for all of this. <clears throat> Many of you might know that there are tons of dying and rising gods in the ancient world. This is often... Uh, modern scholars, especially who uh, like Christianity, insist on trying to deny this, but uh, I've documented extensively the evidence is very clear and undeniable that there were at least these, uh, uh, these um, five that predate Christianity as dying and rising gods. Osiris, I just mentioned. Uh, Osiris, incidentally, if you're baptized into his death and resurrection, you're saved in the afterlife. Does that sound familiar? 
Um, Adonis is another one. Romulus is uh, sort of, he's not a personal savior, he's a savior of the empire, uh, but he has a lot of similarities. His death and resurrection has a lot of similarities with Jesus. But his passion plays, they were actually enacted passion plays of his death and resurrection uh, throughout the Roman Empire as part of his holiday. So Jews who were coming up with their idea of a dying and rising savior God had these models out there in public to look at. Zalmoxis is another one. Uh, he's a Thracian, slash Bulgarian, slash Celtic, we're not sure, dying and rising God. Uh, and his, when you share sacred meals in his honor, uh, you get to be saved in the afterlife. Does that sound familiar? Uh, but he's talked about in Herodotus, and Herodotus was a standard school text for anyone who learned Greek at the level necessary to compose um, uh, creative uh, texts like the Gospels. So in fact, every single Gospel author, we know for a fact, would have read Herodotus and therefore would have known about Zomoxus. Now the oldest of these that we have on record is in Nana. I do think it's interesting that the first dying and rising and in fact crucified God uh, in history was a woman and then almost all the others turned into men suddenly. Um, you can make of that what you will, uh, but in her case uh, she descends to hell, is stripped naked, tried in a kangaroo court, is stricken dead by a death spell, and then her naked corpse is nailed up. Three days later, her minions come down, feed her the food and water of life. She resurrects and ascends to glory. So this uh, crucifixion narrative goes way back. She was the principal goddess of the city of Tyre, uh, which was one of the major port access cities to the region of Judea. So any of you also know the Gospels, Jesus supposedly visits the city of Tyre. So if Jesus existed, he would have been preaching right beside uh, the temple of another crucified deity that people were worshiping, crucified resurrected deity. Um, that would be an unusual coincidence. But I want to warn you against the bad parallels. There are a lot of attempts to argue for parallels with other gods that don't hold up. Uh, we can't really prove them, um, or they're just false. Uh, the Horus parallels, please don't cite those. Um, we can't really establish those as being as strong as they sound. Uh, the others are the ones that I, that I mentioned. Those we can prove uh, a great deal, but uh, the Horus parallels, not so much. Mithra is another one. Oftentimes people will say Mithras is a dying and rising god. That's not the case. Um, we, there were Gospels of Mithras. None of them survive. Uh, but we do have this, which is the comic book version. It's basically the graphic novel of the Gospel of Mithras. And uh, scholars have looked at this and have looked at uh, snippets of writings and discussions of Mithraism and literature and figured out that it does not seem that Mithras himself is a dying and rising god. However, he does undergo some suffering, some sort of passion, uh, where he endures some great struggle through which he gains victory over death. And that's the key parallel. So even though he is not a dying and rising god, he still uh, fits this, the paradigm of these gods. Now, personal savior deities were all the rage at the time. And what they all had in common were these. They were all savior gods, most of them personal saviors. In other words, if you believed in them, got initiated into their cult, you would get saved in the afterlife. Christians didn't invent this. In fact, they're the latecomers. Uh, they, these savior cults, personal savior gods, were already the rage before Christianity arose. They are all the son of God, occasionally the daughter of God, as I mentioned, but in any case, the child of God. They're not the God themselves. They're some sort of agent of God uh, who is recognized as his child, or literally his child. They all undergo a passion, the same Greek word, pathion. Uh, they all have passion stories uh, and passion, some of them passion plays, um, but they all undergo some, what passion means is some sort of suffering or struggle. Uh, it's something that humanizes them in that sense. They all obtained victory over death, which they share with their followers, that's the point of them. They all have stories about them set in human history on Earth. Every single one of them has something equivalent to the Gospels that's placing them in human history as actual humans walking around. Yet none of them ever actually existed. Which means if Jesus existed, he's the outlier. He would be the extraordinary exception to all of these other cases. And that means we need some evidence to back that he's different than these gods. Otherwise, you would expect that he's probably the same as all these others. So here, that's the pagan context that would have influenced uh, this Jewish innovation. But any form of syncretism takes the, from the Jews or any other religion, you combine two ideas to make a new one. And what the Jews did is they would take pagan ideas from surrounding cultures, Judaize them, make them Jewish compatible, and then create a new version of Judaism. And this happened before. Uh, when the Persians conquered Judea um, back in the uh, you know, 539 to 332 BC, roughly in that period, uh, in that period, the Jews were heavily influenced by the Zoroastrian religion, which was the principal religion of the Persian Empire. 
The Zoroastrians were the ones who taught a general resurrection, for example. Um, well, these are the things that Zoroastrianism uh, was teaching. Uh, there were, they taught the idea of a war of a good god versus an evil god, that there was some bad celestial being involved, light versus dark. The idea of bad people burning in some sort of hell and good people waiting in heaven, that was their idea. A river of fire would someday be sent by God and flow over the universe, burning everything up, even hell itself, that was their idea. A new and better world will be created in its place, Zoroastrian. And all the good people will be resurrected by God to live in that new world happily ever after, Zoroastrian. None of these beliefs were a part of Judaism before the Persian influence. Afterwards, all of these things were adopted and incorporated and became standard Jewish beliefs um, in, in, among many sects of Jews, not all of them. So syncretism happened. Jews did this. We know they did this. But the key thing here is, then the Greeks conquered Judea. Then the Romans conquered Judea. Um, the, Jew, the Jews wanted to be the master race, but their God kept uh, giving that title to somebody else. But if the Persians influenced the Jews through that, when you have the Greek conquerors, you have the Roman conquerors, you have hundreds of years of influence, you're going to see syncretism again. Now, before I get to the syncretism, I'm going to tell you about the Jewish element. What, what are the Jews adding to this, among many things? One is the Jews were big on blood magic. Uh, everything was about blood. Uh, in fact, God was kind of not capable of doing anything without blood magic. Uh, so you actually had to kill something and shed its blood before something can be accomplished one way or another. Um, this seems kind of like a rather feeble God, but whatever. Um, but one of the key things goes back to the sacrifice of Isaac, where uh, this is a story, it's an etiological myth, explaining why they have to kill things. Uh, and the idea is God says, you know, Abraham, kill your son. And then he stops him and says, oh, no, wait, we, you don't have to. Um, we'll substitute animals. Uh, and, and this explains animal sacrifice. And you had to do these sacrifices. This was um, regarded as originating, or eventually it originated uh, the Passover. Those of you know that the, if you put splatter blood onto the, your door post in a cross-like fashion, this is in Exodus, um, the angel of death would skip your house and go kill the firstborn of other people's houses. So uh, using blood magic to ward off evil, angel, well, not evil angels, but uh, since all angels are quote unquote good, even though they're slaughtering children, um, the, uh, the whole point of this is they're using blood magic to stave off the angel of death. That's the Passover, and that's a base, one of the most fundamental concepts in Judaism uh, was this Passover idea that you can be saved from death through blood magic. The other is the Yom Kippur. Uh, of course, you accumulate sins. Sin is like some sort of evil fluid that infuses your body. Um, you accumulate it through doing bad, you know, bad things, violating the law, and you have to cleanse that stuff. You have to get that juice out of you. Uh, and so what you do is you do the big, the big mojo, the big, uh, great um, lamb or goat slaughter for the Yom Kippur, where you would pick two animals uh, that looked identical, and one of them you would release, that would be the scapegoat, uh, and eventually people would push it off a cliff so it dies. And then you have the one that you sacrifice on the altar. And then that blood cleanses everybody of their sins for one year. It's only good for a year. You have to keep, uh, keep magic up. It has an a expiration date. Uh, and there's a bunch of other minor past sacrifices throughout the year you can engage in. Now, if you understand this, this is crucial. The temple ceremony of the Yom Kippur was crucial to the Jewish concept of salvation. You had to have your sin, sins cleansed in order to be resurrected in the future. So they had to keep casting this blood magic spell every year in the temple. So it made everything center around the temple. This is the role Jesus played in the origins of Christianity. It's very clear in the epistles of Paul. The function of Jesus in their theology is to replace the temple. There are a lot of political reasons why they would want to do that, and I discussed them on the history city of Jesus. But uh, the key thing is if you want to get, you want to remove the middlemen, you want to remove the temple cults, you want to remove the priesthood and the reliance on the physical geographic control of the temple, you want to get that out of your religion and still have the mojo, well, what you do is you invent a sacrifice that's so powerful that it lasts forever. You don't need to renew it every year. And so they thought up, well, what, to do that, we need really powerful blood magic. What would, be, what would be so powerful that it would last forever? Well, you know what? Like these, these goats we're sacrificing every year, that's, that's weak mojo. What if we sacrificed a person? Okay, that's pretty, that would be pretty powerful. What if that person is the, the son of God, the firstborn son of God? That has to be the most powerful blood magic ever. And so that's the concept behind why Jesus is picked as the figure who has to die uh, to, be, to have his blood shed, so that you can get this super powerful blood magic that will last forever. And I'm not making this up. This is explained in detail in Hebrews 9. So if you want to actually see the logic of it, it's in there. 
So that's what Jesus was for, which means you didn't need an actual historical man. You could just you could take an angel and just make up a story, just like they did with Satan. Uh, when they wanted to create an evil god fighting the good god, because they got that idea from the Zoroastrians, they looked in their angelology, they picked one and created a historical story where Satan rebels at some historical point and is cast down. And there's this whole historical uh, context in which Satan is cast out. Jewish belief was that he was cast out to the lower heavens, the uh, spa outer space just below the moon, and that's where he lives in sky castles up there with his, with his demons and stuff. So this turning Jesus into the ultimate sacrifice could be the same kind of story, just like they did to Satan, invented a little history for him and put him in the sky. They could have done the same thing for Jesus. So this is how you do this. You, this, this combine these concepts. Judeo-pagan syncretism equals Christianity. Let's look at the chart. So you get savior sons of God, already pagan element. Jewish element, well, you have apocalyptic and messianic re resurrection cult. So you just slap that on, add a savior God that fits into that context, and boom, you've got Jesus. Who undergoes an ordeal by which he obtains victory over death. Remember, <laughs> the Jewish element is based on blood atonement magic and theology, substitutionary sacrifice, fundamental to Judaism. Smack those together, you get Christianity. Which he shares with those initiated into his cult, granting individual salvation. The Jewish element is they just adapted Passover and other Jewish salvation theology to create the exact same idea. You would be... Uh, inducted into a universal brotherhood. Uh, fellow inductees, would, fellow initiates would be your brothers and sisters. And the Jews did this too. Originally, the first Christianity, you still had to join Judaism. Uh, for men, you had to cut off a piece of your penis, and everybody had to follow dietary laws. Um, that was the original idea. Like, everybody can join our brotherhood and become brothers and sisters, but you have to, like, go full Jew. Um, <laughs> But then Paul said, you know what, Jesus came to me and he said, uh, he gave me a revelation that he's no longer requiring this, we'll just let everybody join. Which of course made his version of Christianity way more marketable because people don't want to cut off a piece of their penis <laughs> and people like bacon. So, uh, so his version was very popular and he was raking in the dough. Uh, and so there was incentive for the original apostles to say, okay, yeah, we're, we're gonna let you in if we can keep you under control somewhat. And that's how Christianity shifted to become a Gentile religion. And then this would be accomplished in all the other uh, savior cults, as far as we know, through a baptismal initiation and communal meal. Uh, there were baptisms in all of them that were part of the salvation procedure, communal meals in all of them. Um, and that's exactly what the, the Jews just created their own version of a baptismal initiation and communal meal. And so you get basically Christianity, just by combining the popular pagan fashions for savior cults and the Jewish elements. And one way they did this is through a Jewish tradition called Pesher, uh, in which you would basically read the Bible like a Bible code, and you would go digging in it, and you would find passages. The idea of it is that there's the, the literal text, there's the surface text, but then God is sending secret messages in them. Uh, and so like one passage might actually be informing another passage in a completely different book written hundreds of years later, but that's all part of God's plan, right? So if you're smart, you get these revelations from God, and he tells you how to read the Pesher and, and see the secret Bible, the hypertext. It's basically just like HTML um, or CSS, I mean, depending on how you, how you look at it. But, um, and what they get is this kind of thing. And so you can see, I'll show you how you can create the entire Christian gospel through just standard Pesher reading. In fact, really easy stuff. They were coming up with bizarre stuff, the Jews like we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were coming up with all kinds of bizarre Peshers. The Christian Pesher is actually not at all bizarre, actually. It just pops right out of the text. Um, we know that Christians were regarding as scripture the wisdom of Solomon. It's not in most Old Testaments now, but it was regarded as scripture then. And in uh, Wisdom 2 and 5, we have a dying and rising son of God who judges the wicked in heaven. Well, okay, that seems kind of obvious where you get that idea then. Isaiah 52 and 53 has a dying and rising chosen one of God whose death atones for everyone's sins. That's convenient. Daniel 9 and 12 has a literal dying Messiah, chosen one of God conjoined with a final atonement for everyone's sins, which heralds the apocalypse. Sounds like Christianity. And Zechariah 3 and 6, where we have the rising Jesus, son of Jehovah the righteous, who atones for all sins in a single day and is crowned in heaven before God. Um, when you look at these passages, you can just look at them and you say, hey, oh, and by the way, Zechariah 6, that's the angel that Philo says, uh, that's the Jesus that Philo says, is that angel. If you've got this angel in your system and you find the, the, all these passages seem to be talking about the same guy and you know, hit, you know, see this God's secret methodology, you've got the entire Christian gospel right there. It's easy to discover it. 
uh, simply through believing that God inspired you to discover it as a hidden message in there. You don't need an actual guy. You don't need an actual crucifixion. So we'll recap that. Revelation plus scripture equals syncretism. The Jesus the Christians were worshiping was already a heavenly archangel in Jewish theology, as I noted. Some Christians, at the same time the New Testament was written, believed the death and resurrection of this Jesus went on in outer space and was only revealed to the elect and only allegorized in early myths. Christianity looks just like a Jewish version of all the other fashionable savior cults with historicized saviors. None of those saviors existed, but all of them were in, turned into historical persons. And you can find the entire Christian gospel in the Old Testament. Um, that's how Christianity looks like without a Jesus in it. And it's important to point out that the Jews needed a powerful sacrifice to solve the temple problem. Uh, for them, there are a lot of different political reasons why they wanted to get rid of the, certain sects uh, wanted to get rid of the temple. Um, one of the main ones was the fact that God kept telling everybody, like, everybody's saying, why aren't you bringing on the end of the universe? Please end the universe. Get rid of all these horrible people and just resurrect us already. And God keeps promising them that this is going to happen. So why does God not fulfill his promise? Well, the prophets always say, God says you're sinning. Like, when you stop sinning, then I'll, then I'll take care of this business. It's the sin. The sin, too much sin is preventing God from coming down. So some clever Jew said, well, you know what? What if we invent a super powerful sacrifice that cleanses all sins? Well, then God has no excuse not to bring on the apocalypse. Uh, and that's what they did. And so, in fact, Paul says Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of the final resurrection. They believed that the crucifixion of Jesus being revealed to them now was the sign that God had finally cleansed all sins and was now going to end the world any moment now. Uh, and that was the actual component of it. So they were able to use this idea of a, the angelic sacrifice to say that they no longer needed the temple and that the end was nigh. And so it was a convenient thing for them to invent at the time. So why believe that? There are a variety of reasons. Um, I'm not going to go into a great detail on them. They're all you know, in detail in my book. Um, one is it's what typically happens. It's already mainstream now that we know the patriarchs, Moses, Abraham, are fictional. Uh, they're mythical people. They were invented and their stories invented in order to give authority to the teachings. And yet here we have like Exodus and Deuteronomy and so forth. Where we have Moses. He's got, he has a hometown. He has named family members. Uh, he, he has adventures. He travels. He visits places. He uh, um, has teachings. He gives speeches and stuff. All the same things Jesus does. So the Gospels are like a new exodus in that sense. And yet, here it is, someone who never existed. He was made up. Um, so the Jewish patriarchs, same with Abraham and so on. The Jews have already done that before, so it makes sense that they might do it again. I already mentioned the example of pagan savior gods. Uh, they were non-existent, and yet historical stories were invented for them. But I also point out in my book, I analyze the example of modern cargo cults. Um, the actual thing with modern cargo cults uh, isn't that it's a precedent so much as a proof of concept. Uh, and it's a similar thing uh, where these are 20th early 20th century uh, cults in Melanesia and Polynesia that um, have, they start with visions, and then within decades they've invented a fake savior that visited their island, even though at the time of the actual origin of the religion there was no such person. <clears throat> and if you want more on that, I have that in my book, the details and the scholarship on it. But the other reason is that our sequence of evidence corresponds to it. And this is how it goes. The epistles. Now, some of the epistles are forgeries. This is mainstream. Everybody knows this, so we exclude them. But that leaves us with seven epistles of Paul and the epistle to Hebrews, perhaps. The epistles only speak of a pre-existent celestial being and a revealed gospel. That's all they ever mention as source material is revelations and scripture. That's the only place they don't talk about people meeting Jesus or sitting at his feet or anything like that. It's not in there. All they have is this celestial Jesus and revelations. Now, Gospels come decades later, and they're wildly, deliberately fictional. Um, I'm not going to make that case. I think most people here already agree uh, that the Gospels are baloney. They are, in fact, very cleverly constructed myths that serve the purpose of communicating certain ideas and ideals that they wanted uh, to represent. But it's the exact same way the other savior gods were historicized. Historical stories were created for them to represent things that that religion wanted to represent, not because they had sources for it. It wasn't that there was an actual dude. 
And yet all later historicity claims are based on the Gospels, either directly or through Christian intermediaries. So we have no independent corroboration of this invented guy in the Gospels. There's nothing that uh, you can use to confirm what the Gospels are saying about him. And all other evidence, it's worth pointing out, from the first 80 years of Christianity's development was conveniently not preserved, uh, not even in quotation or refutation. Uh, and so there's a huge gap. There would have been hundreds of letters, for example, written in this period by the leaders of the church, all gone. We don't know why they're gone, but they are. So their history was erased. And other evidence was forged in its place. Dozens of gospels, acts, fake epistles, doctor passages. Uh, this was the norm. In fact, uh, if you look at gospels, the ratio of gospels that we know are forgeries to those in the, in the canon, it's 10 to 1 ratio forgery to canon. So in fact, forgery was the normal mode of composition for Christians at this time. So this is my proposal, that Jesus began as a celestial revealed being, just like Gabriel and Moroni. Decades later, a myth was created allegorizing his teachings as a story about a historical man, just like for Osiris and others. That myth got rewritten and elaborated and eventually sold as the truth, and the victorious church actually eliminated or didn't preserve evidence to the contrary, but forged and doctored and created evidence to support their version of the religion. So what was it for? Why would they do this? Um, one is they needed new scriptures. Jesus is the new Moses and Elijah. They didn't like the way Judaism was working out. They needed new scriptures, so they needed a new Moses, they needed a new Elijah. So they just invented one. It was convenient to do that. It was the same reason Moses was invented in the first place. Uh, they also needed to establish a stable authority. Um, if it's based on revelations, then any Joe Blow can walk in and says, you know what, Jesus revealed to me that he changed his mind. You're all wrong. Uh, if you want to put the stop to that, you can say, Jesus was a historical person, he taught so-and-so, so-and-so taught me, and so we have a pedigree, what's your pedigree? Um, so you can actually try to put a control on it. Now, uh, it was a propaganda arms race in this sense, so the, the, to get rid of, to stop the revelation people, they created a historical and a pedigree situation, but then of course the response to that in this arms race was that people started inventing their pedigrees, uh, just as the first ones had been invented, so that didn't work out in the end, but uh, it is the logical progression of things, and Robert Price has shown that uh, Islam had a similar thing with the production of the Hadith. <laughs> Uh, the Gospels were written for guides for missionary life, uh, how to deal with miracles, family, doubters, enemies, etc. These are stories that you tell to actually educate people about how to deal with certain things in life or what they mean. It was also a guide for explaining ritual, the baptism, Eucharist, martyrdom. What were these things? What did they mean? You would create a story that would do that. And explaining the Gospel itself, the salvation. Through parables, Mark Jesus says that he only taught in parables that conceal the truth, and that the truth is not that the parables are historically true, the truth is the allegorical meaning. And that's kind of a clue, because if Jesus taught that way, the evangelist could be teaching that way. The Gospels are just extended parables. Uh, and as John Dominic Crossan wrote a book, The Power of Parable, just recently, he makes this case, uh, that in fact the Gospels are just big parables, uh, using Jesus as the central character. So that's uh, Christianity uh, without Jesus. Thank you. So in OHJ, at one point, you talk about a particular story, I can't remember exactly where it came from, where Jesus is put up um, for execution along with another prisoner, and the mm -hmm. Jews are allowed to choose which one, and they choose right. the wrong one. Mm -hmm. and I'm a little fuzzy and unclear about which one was supposed to be the scapegoat and which one was the sacrifice and why they got it wrong. Yeah, I detail this uh, in OHJ and, and on the historicity of Jesus and cite the scholarship and quote Origen, who also the third century scholar Christian scholar figured it out and was aware of this. Uh, yeah, Jesus and Barabbas. Barabbas is supposed to be the scapegoat, and Jesus is supposed to be the true sacrifice. That's the reality, but what they're trying to represent is that the Jews were not aware of this reality. Um, and then that's, that's the key thing for them. Uh, they thought that the Barabbas would be their, their savior, and so they're actually, that's the, they're not seeing it as a Yom Kippur ceremony. The Christians are seeing it as a Yom Kippur ceremony. They created it that way. So the whole message of it is don't choose the wrong savior, essentially. Don't choose the military messiah. Choose the messiah who sacrifices, well, choose Jesus, basically, is their point. Um, but for more detail on that, yeah, you can read different aspects of it. Like Origen's discussion of it is probably one of the most important because that's an actual Christian in the third century telling us what it means. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, I often hear scholars argue that 
the way the gospel is formed was an oral tradition that started after the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But if you get rid of the historical Jesus and you have only visions and interpretations of scripture, exactly is there an oral tradition to speak of in the strict sense? Uh, well, maybe. Um, I, th I think in reality, most of what's going on in the Gospels is original composition. They're just making the stuff okay. up that they want. Now, they also they are drawing sayings of Jesus from other people. Sometimes from the letters of Paul, Paul will say something. He doesn't identify as coming from Jesus, but suddenly Jesus is preaching it in the Gospels. Well, that's convenient. Paul didn't know it, but that, that was happening. But uh, So that, that's the kind of thing. That's not an oral tradition. That's really a written tradition. But there may have been a lot of oral tradition in terms of the revelations, because Paul happens to mention things in his letters. But he also says that there's a lot of other revelations going on. People are having these prophetic ecstatic ceremonies so in the churches. Come start coming together. Yeah, yeah. So there may have been other revelatory sayings that were getting passed on in oral tradition. We have examples that maybe this was going on uh, in one Clement, uh, the letter I talk about it in, on the history of, of Jesus. We just don't know. Uh, it could all be coming from scripture. They're finding stuff in scripture. It could all, some of it could be oral lore. Um, but the oral lore would be oral lore about revelations, not about the historical Jesus. As uh, far as the way Zoroastrianism, um, if that's, yeah, um, influenced Christianity, um, like as far as heaven and hell goes, um, I one one thing I noticed, like when I was reading the Bible, like at K, I'm not sure if it makes any difference, but K KJV um, without mm -hmm. the apocrypha, but. Um, was that in the Old Testament, heaven and hell seemed to always mean like the sky or um, the ground or something like mm -hmm. death um, right. um, in, in the context there versus in the New Testament seemed to mean something else. Um, I, I, I was wondering if I could infer from that that the Zoroastrian influence would have been right around yes. 100 AD, I mean. Oh, no, no, uh, or earlier. A um, lot the, earlier. Yeah, the, well, the, it's, it's in, what's called intertestamental. So the, the, a lot of the influence came about in between the conclusion of the Old Testament and the start of Christianity. So a few hundred years there. <coughs> so we're talking roughly like 300 BC, let's say. But between that and 100 BC is when a lot of this stuff is being integrated. Um, and it might have started earlier than that, but that's when we start to see like like full on stuff. Um, it's important to note that uh, in the Old Testament, there's n almost no references to resurrection. Uh, there's a few, and the only ones that we can find are actually texts written during the Persian occupation. So we can see that resurrection, for example, is coming in at this point. Um, similar with heaven and hell, the, the they have heaven. But it's generally just occupied by God and his angels. The idea that our souls get to go there is something that that's, comes about later. It's after the Old Testament. And that's a Zoroastrian influence. The idea of there being a hell, the, the Gehenna is not really a hell. It's just basically the grave. They're just talking about your body sits in there. And you can summon a spirit out of it, uh, out of the body in, in the grave. Um, and we have that like the Witch of Endor in the Old Testament. Um, so that was part of their belief, but they didn't have really an idea that it just sleeps in the grave unless you, a witch summons you. So there's not, there's not really a hell, per se. Uh, but the idea that there was torture for, uh, for the afterlife for people who were bad, that was a Zoroastrian idea that infiltrated Judaism after the Old Testament. We don't actually see it in the Old Testament. Uh, it also influenced pagans, too. We have the, the Stoics adopted the idea of the, the tormenting in hell, uh, the you know, burning in hell kind of stuff. We see the same influence. That's from the common Zoroastrian influence on both religions. So it would be like about right after the Old Testament was written, and then that would explain why Sadducees and Pharisees would have been had that split. Yeah, and there's the, and there was more than Sadducees and Pharisees. There's some ten to twenty different religious sects yeah, of okay. Jews, um, and yes, they all did different things. Like Sadducees didn't uh, believe in a lot of the supernatural stuff, uh, so they were. Uh, very different from the Pharisees, uh, but then there were other sects that were at odds with both of them. So it's uh, it was very diverse, much more diverse than people think. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm reading your book right now, and I want to thank you. It it looks like um, it it wasn't any fun to do because there's like so many cross references. You have to read <laughs> so much stuff that's in the canon and outside the canon and mm -hmm. put it all together. And I was kind of uh, wondering um, how you, you came to this, because 
I, I think most people learn all this stuff by going to seminary and then they get discouraged when they find out it's inconsistent and then they leave and <laughs> it's this horrible you know, uh, thing that they never want to look back at. But then you seem to be very um, happy and eager to do the work and yeah. <laughs> not have any burden. I just wondered how that came about. Um, well, I'm a historian at heart, so it's fascinating to me. That's That drives me. Um, I'm just interested in finding out the truth and then looking at all this weird stuff that's out there. That, that's, that's exciting to me. So I actually enjoyed uh, doing all the research for it. Um, the, um, uh, the reason is, though, I, I, my PhD in ancient history, what one of the functions of getting a PhD in ancient history, like at Columbia University or something like that, uh, the function of it is to teach you to do exactly these kinds of things. So you have, like, here's a problem in ancient history I want to solve. The procedure we go through to get myself informed on all the materials and then build a hypothesis and test a hypothesis. Um, so that's why I had, was, had the drive and capability to pull that off, is that I'm coming at it not from a Christian trying to defend the tradition, but from an outsider just trying to find out what the truth is and actually studying this just the same way I would study Osiris cult or any other religion. Um, so in that sense, it was, it was fascinating and enjoyable. Hi, Richard. Thanks for the talk. Very good. Um, very enjoyable. Uh, my question is based on an assumption. I think it's pretty safe. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with Bart Ehrman's Historical Jesus yeah. book, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. So basically, um, I'm usually a fan of his work. I think he does pretty good work in general. I he does often, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I still being... recommend Jesus Interrupted as the best introduction mm -hmm. to New Testament studies. Even when it's wrong, it's correct in presenting that's what the mainstream view is. So, right, uh, so right. it's a really good text in that regard. And he's many others. Forged is one of a great book, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, basically, I remember it's been a couple of years reading it, being fairly convinced by the historical Jesus, uh, but I'm kind of more agnostic about that point, about whether uh, the historical Jesus really existed. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you have written uh, a response to uh, that oh. book, The Historical Jesus, uh, by yeah. Herman, and if, right. if so, where can I find it, and if not, yeah. can you give some brief comments on what you think? Okay. Yeah, well, no, for sure. No, you, you'll, want to read, you'll want to read through the whole thing. Uh, I have a th you just Google uh, Richard Carrier, Bart Ehrman, recap. Uh, and you, you should find it. It's, it's my recap of all of our exchanges, me and him, uh, over time, and where they concluded. Uh, most of them concluded with him shutting up and not saying anything. Um, and or occasionally with him lying, uh, which I actually document some cases of him lying about uh, mistakes he made, um, which is unfortunate because he could have just admitted he made mistakes and corrected himself, but uh, he dug, dug digger hole, bigger hole. But, uh, but I, I present the evidence for it, so you don't have to take my word for it. You can go in there and look at it. But I've, I've got it all summarized with links and everything. Uh, and that's... Short version you can give me of what's wrong with this book? Um, well, it, it violates certain canons of logic, uh, as I point out, like he makes illogical arguments. Um, he strawmans the mythicist case. Uh, he doesn't fairly treat it at all. In fact, nowhere in his book, this, the book is called Did Jesus Exist? Uh, nowhere in his book does he present a coherent mythicist thesis. So he never actually talks about what he's arguing against. He just picks random claims made by mythicists and, and, and debunks them or tries to. Um, but at no point would you learn what their actual thesis is for the origins of Christianity and what their case is for that thesis. He just doesn't even discuss it, which is fundamental error in terms of how you're supposed to approach a critique of an alternative theory. Um, and he only comes down to like two pieces of evidence. Uh, he's stuck up on the, the brother of the Lord issue. There's a reference to brothers of the Lord in the epistles. He's certain that that means biological brothers, even though we have plenty of evidence that it could easily mean just baptized Christians. Um, because all baptized Christians were sons of God, and therefore they would be de facto the brothers of the Lord, right? The, the first son of God. He was just the firstborn of the many brethren, as Paul literally says in, in uh, one of his epistles. So uh, he's hung up on that, and he's hung up on the, the Jews would never invent a crucifixion. Um, and that doesn't make any sense. Uh, of course they would. Uh, they invented all kinds of wild things. Uh, and it served a fundamental purpose, and that's kind of what my talk... Yeah, it's kind of what my talk is here about today, like why they would invent that. Like they needed it to accomplish certain political and social goals. So. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My question is somewhat similar, but I wanted to ask you, we talked about Bart Ehrman a little earlier, and uh, mm -hmm. what do um, biblical scholars such as Bart Ehrman present typically as their strongest argument from the ex for the existence of Jesus, and why, in your opinion, it doesn't hold up? Yeah, I mean, there's 
what I think is the strongest argument, and what they think, I'm not sure what is their strongest argument. I, I personally think Can there's- Can you do both? Yeah, I'll try. Um, <laughs> what, what I think is their strongest argument is the brothers of the Lord and the birth statements uh, in the epistles, which I address in On the History of the City of Jesus. Um, it's the strongest because you do have to make in a case that explains why it doesn't hold up. It's not obvious. Um, so, so at least that's, that's all they've got, really. So that's, that's the argument that has to hinge there, is to can we establish that he, he's talking about biological stuff or not? Um, and, and that's all covered in On the History of the City of Jesus. Uh, sometimes I get the impression that they think their strongest argument is that they can prove historical stuff in the Gospels, which bewilders me because you just can't. Um, and many scholars have pointed this out. I, um, in my, my first book uh, in this series, Proving History, I document that every single scholar in Jesus studies who published a dedicated study of the methods being used to extract history from the Gospels, everyone who's published a dedicated study of those methods has concluded they don't work. Um, and yet Ehrman keeps using them over and over again, and he, seem, he seems really impressed by these methods. I don't understand why he hasn't caught up with the rest of his field on this. Um, so I find that to be an extraordinarily weak argument, uh, but sometimes it looks like they think it's a strong one. A little yeah. off topic, but okay. um, Philo of Alexandria. I've been contemplating uh, reading some, but I'm afraid I just not have the context for it. Is there? Mm. A good gloss that's worth reading, or a good, a good I, what? Something, a, a, a some sort of a summary, or a. a you mean or a, should a, I actually look for a translation? Would I understand this? Not living in in the culture. Yeah, but you mean specifically the passages I'm talking about, or no, all of his works? All of oh yeah, um, well yeah. There's um, a young uh, Y O N G E is the translator of the collected works of Philo. You can get in one big book, and it's you can get it hardcover, kind of cheap actually. Okay. Uh, I have to warn you though, it's huge. Uh, it's bigger than it's way bigger than the Bible. Like we have lots of Philo's writings. Interestingly, we do not have all of Philo's writings, despite all of the, the vast number of his writings being preserved. Certain ones weirdly were not, like his entire history of Pontius Pilate. It's oh. mysteriously disappeared from this collection. Um, I hypothesize that that disappeared because Christians were upset that it didn't mention Jesus. Um, but uh, but we know it's, it's a lot of stuff. And a lot of it is really tedious and boring because it's it's weird religious commentary. That, although some of it's really fascinating because you're like, this is bizarre. This is like reading Scientology. Um, <laughs> so it, yeah, so that, that's, that would make my caveat. But the book is easily acquirable. OK. Yeah. That would, then you essentially mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, that's it. All Thank right. you, sir.